Hey everybody, Isaac here, and welcome to the seventh episode of Between Two Cats, the podcast where we take a peek behind the curtain of the biggest names in the quantum programming community. In this episode, I got to speak with Alba, who's a senior researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and a coordinator of the Quantum Spain Project, which is an initiative to boost the Spanish quantum computing ecosystem. Alba has done a lot of great work for being such a young scientist. I'll put her Google Scholar page in the description down below. Definitely go check out some of her papers if you haven't already. I had a lot of fun talking to Alba in this interview, and I also learned about a really funny and quirky Spanish uh, Christmas tradition, so definitely stick around for that. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel so that you know when more of these episodes drop. Like this video if you liked it, and uh, without further ado, here's Alba. Alba, how's it going? Nice to have you here. I'm also very happy to be here, to be back to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you, 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 were, you were a postdoc in Toronto for a little bit yes. at uh, Zapata? Or at, no, under, at U of T. At U of, sorry, at U of T, but you were with... Uh, Alan Alan. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> exactly. he's with Zapata now, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, How's it, has it been so far? Like, what do you miss the most about Toronto? Like, Oh, definitely the snow. Yeah. I know that people will be very surprised about that. Yeah. <laughs> but I come from Barcelona where everything is very warm and I like snow. I really enjoyed uh, my time here. Nice, nice. Um, I, I was actually talking to uh, Zoe about this uh, the other day. She, um, she flew in a little early to Toronto and got to see like a hockey game. Uh, and yeah, like got to we experience. went together. Oh, you went to you yeah, went with yeah, her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How was that? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we it was a lot of fun because none of us knew the rules. <laughs> yeah. So we were trying to figure out the rules on the fly, and it, it was a lot of fun. So cool. We really, really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna actually. One sec here. Is that, is that... Perfect. Yeah. Was that your first hockey game that you've ever been to? Yes. Nice. <laughs> um. So yeah, like overall thoughts. Like I know thought. I know hockey's like a pretty. It can be a pretty like violent sport, or not like violent, but physical, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 so funny. I, I like to make this analogy a lot. Like it's just it's football, but people are wearing knife shoes. <laughs> and so yeah, like are I would say that it's more like rugby, but you are wearing this, uh, you know, knife because it, it reminds me a lot of a uh, lot of rugby because it's also also yeah. very physical. Yeah. It seems very violent, but somehow there is some rules. So it was not clear to me when the rules were acceptable and when were not. So yeah, the the rules in hockey are really difficult to follow. Um, also, <laughs> just there's there's some controversy around hockey in general right now with just like, uh, you know, it, I think this is a trend across all sports. With a human referee, there's mm -hmm. just a lot of mistakes. Of course. And since hockey's like such a fast paced mm -hmm. game, like refs make a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. and uh so that does make it for like a beginner watching hockey to like mm -hmm. it makes it difficult to kind of understand what's going on because of that because like the <laughs> yeah. rules sometimes are called the way they should be and sometimes there's gaffes and mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's it's a mess but yeah glad you enjoyed that mm -hmm. um yeah like it, it's good that you can kind of experience these like canadian staples yes. yeah hockey's definitely one of those things <laughs> yeah i realize that <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, let's get into the more like academic -y sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you're a recently graduated PhD student as of 2019. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you spent a bit of time in Toronto, now you're back in Barcelona, as you said. Um, you're a researcher at the Quantique Group. Yes. Um, but what I think is really awesome is mm -hmm. that you're involved in is the Quantum Spain project. So can you, mm -hmm. can you tell me more about that? Yeah, it is, like, it is like a very, very ambitious project that we have in Spain. So I'm the coordinator of this initiative, which is like a kind of national thing. Uh, and we are 27 institutions. So it's really nice that we put together a big project where everybody that knows about quantum computing in Spain and in academia is working together. And the main goal is to have our own quantum computer installed in our supercomputing center in Barcelona. So everybody in our community will be will have free access to this computer to explore how it works, to see if they can leverage other algorithms with quantum and so on. So it's it's very amazing. Cool. Do, do you have any like I, I know this project's like still relatively new, mm -hmm. but do you have any insight on like what you know, there's many different ways to make a quantum mm -hmm. computer. Like, what is the actual sort of way that you guys are going to skin this cat, so to so, speak? So, actually, we have now access to the first prototypes. Okay. So, we are uh, targeting a superconducting circuit quantum sure. computer, a digital okay. one. 
And the goal is to be installed on site. So the, the final goal of the project will be to integrate this quantum computer with our supercomputer that is called Mare Nostrum. Uh, that, that will be very cool because that will allow us to, to run hybrid algorithms, HPC and quantum and, and so on. But in the meantime, we have remote access to the first chip of five qubits. And we are learning how to use it, especially from uh, the operational perspective, because it's not only uh, that we use that uh, as a users, but we need to be prepared to uh, open the chip to everybody else. Mm. So how to manage the jobs, how to manage the schedulers, how to manage the calibration and these kind of things. So we are now yeah. working on that. But, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So like that's a little bit of what, what you're up to right now. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go to like the opposite end of things now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what was life like for you as a kid? Like, how did you get into physics? What were your hobbies? Like, how did you eventually think that physics was a good idea? <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know what a physicist was until the very end of my high school. Oh, course. really? Nice. Yeah, because it's like something very abstract. Of course, you do physics, but it's there is no a sub physics subject in my high school or okay. school. It was like natural sciences, and you do okay. a lot of things: biology, and mathematics, physics, chemistry, everything. Sure. So since I was a child, I was really interested to science in general. So I have this kind, I mean, I'm not so old, but I, I used to have an encyclopedia. So I yeah. used to, you know, uh, read all of it and, and see the, and, and watching all the, all the pictures. And I was very attracted to the world of, uh, of the universe, the planets, the black holes, all this stuff. So that's why I believe that in the end, I was kind of targeted towards physics at the end of the high, my high school. But to be honest, I just picked the physics because uh, I had a very good professor, a physics professor. And yeah, that made me just decide, okay, let's try physics. And once I entered to the degree, I just realized, okay, a physicist is more than just astrophysics, of course. Yeah. And I learned a lot of new things that I didn't know they existed in the first place, including quantum information, of course. Yeah, yeah. So it was your, it was your high, I don't know if it's called the same in, in <laughs> Spain, but like your high school or secondary school, <laughs> it was your physics teacher there that <laughs> kind of got you into the, got you into physics. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, to me, high school is up to 17 years old, so right before the university. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah same for us. <laughs> yeah, um, same story for me, pretty much. Uh, my high school physics teacher, like I was, I was hell bent on being like a musician in high school and then, um, you oh, know. Me too. Oh, really? I, I used to play music a lot, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, do you, what do you play? I used to play piano and clarinet. Oh, nice. Yeah, cool. and during some time when I was like 14 or so, I was uh, I was thinking about just dedicating uh, dedicated to music, so okay. like going to the conservatory and these kind of things. But eventually, I, I realized that I, I, I was preferring science. But I took that decision. But on the other side, I have a cousin. She also follow a very similar path as me. Sweet. But she uh, chose the, to dedicate uh, her career in, in to playing guitar professionally. So oh, it was, nice. But she also started physics. So it's like kind of uh, oh, curious, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's funny. Yeah, so I mean, I was I was gonna be a mu or well, I thought I was gonna be a musician in, in high school, and then yeah, my physics teacher in high school, great person, um, you know, and I just did really well in a test, and mm -hmm. then I was like, oh, you know, I just presented. I was always okay at math, mm -hmm. and uh, just presented an alternate path for me that I had hadn't explored yet, mm -hmm. and you know, here I am. <laughs> so I think there is a kind of correlation between. Uh, Physicist, music, and yeah. climbing. I'm, I'm not used to climb, but I know many physicists that like to climb, rocky climbing, it's, and so on. So I don't know what, what's going on, and I don't know why is that, but uh, yeah. either we are musicians or, or climbers. <laughs> it's so funny that you say that. Yeah, like um, I've, I've had this conversation with pretty much everybody I've talked to. Uh, since I came to Xanadu, or like before, I had really like, I, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I came from a small town, granted, <laughs> but. I knew nobody that climbed for like a hobby. Mm -hmm. So like when I came here, it was like everybody climbed. <laughs> it was like the highest concentration of climbers that I'd mm -hmm. ever been around. And it was uh, I just, and yeah, like mm -hmm. I've talked to people outside of Xanadu and like they also climb and it's just like, yeah, it's an <laughs> odd thing, you know? Yeah, like, the same happens in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you don't, you don't climb though? No. No, okay. no, I never tried, to be honest. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of not scared. But if I started, probably I will just uh, start to, I will probably couldn't stop to do it as other physicists because that's what happened with some of my friends. Yeah. So I don't know what 
climbing has that everybody just get a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, out of out of secondary school, you go to University of Barcelona, you start studying physics, you, you know, realize physics isn't just about like yeah. black holes, you know, yeah. you learn about some quantum information and yeah. stuff like that. Um, I, I have a question kind of unrelated to physics particularly here though, like <clears throat> for me, um, in, in my undergrad, I really thought that like the way to, to, to do undergrad was mm -hmm. to just like do really good on tests mm -hmm. and just like totally hit the books and just like try and do as best as you possibly can in courses. And I really like burnt myself out doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so like, was there something really valuable that you learned about life in undergrad? Mm -hmm. And like, did that help you at all get through like grad school at all? Mm -hmm. um, Actually, um, I was not really good at tests. So okay. I ended up my, my degree, my physics degree, with a very you know, a standard mark. Actually, so bad that I, I, I knew that I couldn't access to most of the grants to start a PhD. So it was, to me, it was a long shot because uh, I decided at the end of my, of, of my undergrad to, to focus on the final degree project. Mm. Because to me, that was the way to prove myself that if I was valuable or not to do research, because that was the first opportunity to really do research and not just studying and that's it. So I did, it was my first, uh, my, my best uh, mark so far. Mm. So it was a 10 actually. So that's why I decided to, okay, whatever it costs, I need to continue this path and do my PhD. Yeah. So to me, when I, I, I was a super good student in my high school all, all my life. And when I entered to the physics degree, it was like, uh, I don't know how to say it in English. I think it's like a cure, a humble cure or things like that. Like I realized, I mean, not only me, but also my friends, that it doesn't matter that you were a good student because you really learn how to study once you enter to the physics degree. Because many things, I mean, I, I, I used to have good marks without studying and just catching things very easily and so on. But that changed completely when I had to, you know, I have a, a really big uh, challenge in front of me with, uh, with several subjects. So I learned how to study and I learned that if I can pass this test, and I, I'm saying, for instance, general relativity was one of these ones, I can do anything. It, do, it will just take time. Uh, maybe I will not pass it at the, at the beginning, but eventually I will, I will just pass it. So it just need time to, to just absorb everything and to learn yeah. it. That's such a good way of looking at it. Um, admittedly, I didn't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. I felt like like studying was just like that is the be all and end all, mm -hmm. and just like getting that final result was 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 the cookie that you're supposed to chase. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I kind of wish I'd taken a step back and and realized after I took my general relativity mm -hmm. course like what I just did, because mm -hmm. um, I was just so hell bent on getting the number mm -hmm. at the end of it all. And uh, yeah, I mean I I appreciate your mm -hmm kind of kind of take on that just kind of hmm. letting letting the accomplishment hmm. just marinate and you know going from there it took me some time obviously I mean, oh, I was yeah. failing. but on the other side in my short experience I realized that there is not always a correlation between a good mark student and someone that is good at research for instance so I realized that people that maybe they don't have the best marks they are probably people that put more effort and more interest because if they are there and they are coming every day and trying and trying, it's because they, they know how to be independent, they know how to uh, survive the, this mm. kind of disappointment sometimes. And, and people that have good marks, I'm not saying that's a general thing at all, yeah. but maybe they didn't face these challenges yet. Yep. So they just face it for the first time during the, the research path, and that's why in some cases it, it doesn't work for them. So. Yeah, that person who you were talking about that is a, a good in, good in class, and then like when they hit the research world, it's <laughs> like a whole other can of worms that they're not good at. That was me. Oh, yeah, come <laughs> on, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> oh no. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I uh, I I was originally in a PhD, and then I kind of cut it short and just did a master's yeah. instead. Um, hmm. Yeah, because I just felt it really wasn't hmm. for me. Um, but you know, I'm glad I did. But hmm. uh, yeah, I think that does ring true a lot in a lot of cases. As you're hmm. saying, like not generally speaking, hmm. there are a lot of people that you know hmm. do well at pretty much everything in life. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, like I guess TLDR here is like good marks don't equal like great research. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Kind of right when you were starting as uh, a young physics student, like the big boom in machine learning was was kind of happening around that time or it had already happened at, at least there was a 
big concerted paradigm shift in mm -hmm. like numerical physics to mm -hmm. um, you know stop doing like quantum Monte Carlo simulations all mm -hmm. the time and mm -hmm. like do machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, your like so your thesis title, you know, I googled your thesis titles <laughs> and stuff like that, right? So I would say your your physics education or your, your the, the areas where you put points in are more traditional, whatever that means. So like entanglement scaling and algorithms, non-unitary neutrino oscillations. <laughs> that was my master. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but I, I, during that time also, I saw that you were able to actually dabble in a bit of quantum programming hmm. um, with, with Qiskit and hmm. you were doing that in your PhD as well. So hmm. like, yeah, coming from a more traditional aspect of, of what physics is, like what was the biggest adjustment you had to make in that sort of area where things were changing so quickly? Mm -hmm. And I mean, now you're obviously, mm -hmm. you know, in the field of machine learning, quantum computing, quantum information, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, what was the biggest adjustment? Like, what was the thing you had to catch up on the most? Like, programming, anything like that? Yeah, like what was, what was the biggest mm -hmm. adjustment you had to make? Well, I would say that I'm part of this uh, probably transition generation, so in quantum information and in particular in quantum computing, because my PhD, for instance, is very miscellaneous. <laughs> so I started my PhD in high energy physics, actually, uh, from a quantum information point of view. But then what happens is uh, 2016 arrived, the IBM computers started to be on the cloud. So that changed the, completely my perspective of the PhD. So that's why I started focusing more on quantum computing, which was not the original intention anyway. So that means that I started learning how to program a quantum computer, how to use it a real uh, experimental device. So to me, it was a very change of paradigm because uh, I thought that my career would always be a theoretical physics. And I was running experiments, so it was I was completely against experiments because I, I, I always thought that I was not good at it. I didn't have the patience to be in, stuck in a lab. Yeah. But then I realized, wait, I'm doing the same way from my computer, basically. Yeah. So that, uh, that to me was a big adjustment. Um, but yeah, the programming part was also important because during my physics degree, I only learned how to program in Fortran. <laughs> you only learned how to program in Fortran? Yes. Who is who is who is this teaching you like this? Well, is... people that uh, it's old enough that they didn't uh, learn Python wow. yet, I guess, <laughs> and they didn't want to change the syllabus. Uh, I think that changed now for for for, the well, yeah, for but, the physics degree. So yeah. now they learn uh, Python and also Fortran, of course, because uh, all the computational physics. Uh, uh, subject, most of the libraries are program on Fortran, which by the way, I think it's good, actually, mm -hmm. because yeah. it learned, uh, it helped me to learn how to program from completely scratch, like how to multiply matrices, all of this completely scratch. No, yep. no sci-fi libraries, no NumPy, nothing that can help you with that. So that, that, that was good for learning. But then afterwards, I, I started my PhD and it's like, I don't even know how to type in Python. What, what the hell? Yeah. So I decided to just sit and learn it by, by myself and <laughs> since then I'm it's the same as I was mentioning before with with uh, passing some uh, very difficult tests uh, during the physics degree just you know you will you will do it it's just it's a matter of time but you have the capacity to do it mm. so you just sit uh, one afternoon two afternoons whatever it takes yeah. to learn a new language and to adapt to the new changes so it's part of the research path yeah know? Yeah, I really like your outlook on all this stuff. Just mm -hmm. you're, you're not looking for that like immediate gratification. You know, it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, um, that is absolutely crazy, though, that like, OK, well, so at least in North America, mm -hmm. nobody teaches you, well, in physics or mm -hmm. anything like that. I, I can honestly say that like Fortran's just mm -hmm. a, a thing mm -hmm. of the past. I mean, it's for 90. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So but I mean, it's it's still ubiquitous on every laptop, mm -hmm. like, right, there's Every everything like NumPy, whatever, like mm. everything relies on some slight variation of blast, mm. and it's yeah. But it's just a it's 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 so funny that it's just a, a language that's just a uh, an, an a, a relic of the past. But it's really used still now. Yeah, yeah. For especially for high energy <clears throat> physics, because yeah. you know all these long pieces that basically means extending some super long code in Fortran a little bit more to do some <laughs> kind of, uh, of analysis of all the data that yeah. comes out from, 
from LHC or, yeah. or these kind of experiments. So I think that is also part of the tradition, and mm. that's why we learn for them because our professors are, in their majority, experts in in high energy physics, yeah. and that they were used to it. And I really think it's good because of that, because it was a good way to have yeah. a very general structure about programming. But at the same time, it's like it's great, but then you, we can also learn something more modern, please. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, that changed. So now the, the new generations are learning Python, unfortunately. <laughs> so you don't have to teach them Python. But anyway, if not, you're just learning. And that, that helped me with the quantum languages because now there are so many quantum languages, like, of course, Qiskit, Penilane, yeah. um, Cirque, uh, Kibo, etc. Yeah. So it's like, okay, it's just another language. So I will just sit, I will just learn it, and I will yeah. just uh, master the syntax, and that's it. I mean, it will take me one afternoon, two afternoons, depending on my experience or depending on what I want to do. But I did that before. With Python, so it's okay. It yeah. will be fine. Awesome. Love that. This little segment's called random sampling. We're just gonna ask some pretty like random questions. Cool. Cool. Okay. Like totally unrelated to physics. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, I think people who are multilingual are mm -hmm. like really awesome. Um, I spoke French for a long time. Like I was very fluent in French. Um, Mm -hmm. One of those things where I didn't use it, so I kind of lost it. But mm -hmm. anyway, one of the stereotypes of the Spanish language is that mm -hmm. it's spoken very quickly. Yes. And I think that I, I, th I, I think it's honestly a little true too. Mm -hmm. Like the words per minute that that a Spanish speaker can can crank out is mm -hmm. a little a little staggering. So um, working with a few Spanish speaking individuals here too, I, I kind of see it. Mm -hmm. um, we speak a little slower in English. So do you have to like mentally adjust? For when you speak English, like, is your mind ahead of you when you're speaking? Yes, you know? definitely. Is it yeah. really? Okay. Yeah, 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 completely. Actually, it it frustrated me for a while when I mean my English is not the best, but it was much worse some time ago. Your English is really and, good. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, after two years in Canada, I, I hope see, I so. See. But yeah. uh, anyway, I still have the feeling that it's not good enough, and I think it's because of that because I cannot. Uh, I can't um, speak as fast as I would like to in English because it takes me a little bit to just adjust. Yeah. And I don't have a, a, the same vocabulary that I have in Spanish, right. of course. So that creates some kind of internal frustration sometimes. It's like, I want to explain so many things and I don't have the <laughs> proper words and, and I don't have the time because I have the feeling that you yeah. are waiting for me. And, and, and yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, you're completely right. It's probably because Spanish is a very fast language. Yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. <laughs> I thought that maybe that wasn't going to be true, but interesting <laughs> to hear that from you. Okay. Uh, speaking of one of my Spanish coworkers, um, Guillermo, he, he's actually from just outside of Barcelona in a smaller <laughs> town. But um, anyway, he loves this dessert called uh, panettone. Panettone? Yeah. Um, around here, it's a little controversial. I don't know. I don't know. Like, like uh, I've never tried it, but mm. a couple of my colleagues have, and they, it seems to be a very polarized thing. Um, really? What are your thoughts on it? Maybe you can, you can explain kind of what it is. Uh, okay. I think panettone, it's, uh, it's not a Spanish desert. It's an Italian one. <gasps> oh, okay. So, okay. so because to be honest, uh, it's something that I always see in the supermarkets during uh, um, Christmas season. Right. But I don't really, I mean, I think I tried once only. So I would not, I would not say that this is the traditional um, Spanish desert. Okay. But maybe Guillermo, in, in there, I mean, there are some families that really like it, and that's why it's in the supermarket. So I maybe see. it's because of that. So I don't have any strong opinion in, in that <laughs> okay. in that sense. So I would say that if you want to find some strong opinions in Spain uh, with some kind of food, you have to ask if the tortilla de patata, so the the, the Spanish omelette, okay. has to contain onions or not. Because oh, there is really? a huge fight in that sense. In my opinion, of course, because otherwise it's just eggs with potatoes, and this is not a tortilla. <laughs> to okay. me, a tortilla contains onions, but there is like Spanish people is divided by, because of that. And also, of course, what is a paella? Because if you're not in Barcelona area so much, but if you go to Valencia, where paellas are originally, uh, they have also a huge fight of what do you put in the paella and what you shouldn't. And uh, like very big discussions about that. So Interesting. You, you, if you are interviewing another Spanish guy or <laughs> girl, you should ask these kind of I will. These questions probably. I'll note that down. Okay, awesome. Uh, speaking of food, like uh, what's your favorite dish to cook at home? <laughs> I don't like to cook. Okay, no, fair <laughs> okay. enough, fair enough. But I, I mean, now I don't cook so much anymore because my partner used to cook <laughs> all the time. But the favorite dish, I would say, the, yeah, the Spanish omelette, the tortilla. Okay. I like it very much. It's very simple. And I love potatoes in any form. No, no, no.
So, so that's uh, probably my favorite dish. I think potatoes are just internationally loved. Yeah. I love potatoes yeah. as well. You can cook a potato a million different ways. Exactly. So love it. Any way they can fit on our plate. Do you have any funny stories from when you worked with uh, Alain in, in Toronto as a postdoc? He, like, he seems like mm. he's quite lively and funny. <laughs> like, I follow him on Twitter. Like, uh, people who graduate or come mm. to his group, I don't, I, I can't remember. He, like, dresses them up in like a luchador <laughs> mask and stuff like that. He seems like a pretty funny guy. I've never met him, but. Yeah, actually, um, I mean, my funniest story is when I met him for the first time and during my interview mm. that, yeah, yeah, he was like a very close person. Also, I mean, I think it helped that I was a Spanish and, and he's Mexican. So the, our attitude is very similar. Our cultures have many things in common. So it was mm. uh, very friendly since the very beginning. So I was expecting something much more formal and that was not the case at all. Uh, but besides that, uh, also, of course, we also take the picture with the uh, luchador mask. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have much more things to say because I was here during COVID times. Oh, right. Okay. So okay. I was here six months and then COVID strikes. So all the rest of my time, it was everything was online, except with I, with a few people, we make a kind of a bubble, a social sure. bubble. But Alani, of course, was not uh, was not there. And of course, we had a lot of interaction. He cared about us a lot, but we couldn't, you know, really enjoy. It was not part of sure. any retreat, this mm. kind of stuff, because uh, the, I I just uh, left at the very end of the pandemic, mostly. So sure. unfortunately, I didn't have so many things to tell, to talk about. There's this funny tradition. I I found it kind of funny uh, mm. tradition. This is actually a Spanish tradition. I mm. did check this out. Uh, called Tio de Nadal. <laughs> so, I was kind of expecting that when you mentioned like a weird tradition. It's actually Catalan tradition. So oh, okay, it's okay. not only in uh, all parts of Spain, but uh, only in Catalonia and some parts of Aragon and Valencia. So. Okay. So like from what there's a, there, it's just, I think you just need to explain kind of what it, what it is. Okay. And if you, <laughs> if you ever had celebrated. It. Of course. Every okay. year. Every really? Year. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's very traditional in my family. Okay. So the story goes. Um, it's a very old tradition. I think it comes also from before, uh, you know, the, the Christianity came to, to, to the peninsula and so on. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can clearly see that this is pagan for sure. So uh, in Christmas, we take like a piece of log and we put like a mask on it and some helmet and everything. We cover it with a with a blanket because, of course, it's it's Christmas time, and we feed it uh, every day, like with standard food, like I don't know chocolate or fruits, whatever. And then the the Christmas day, you have to make it poop because, of course, <laughs> <laughs> he, he ate a lot of things during several days. Sure. So to make him poop, you have to take a stick, and just um, you know how is to say um, just. Just whack Kick him. Yeah, Kick him. Yeah. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Yeah. Uh, all the time while you uh, you uh, you sang a song uh, yeah. like Caga Tio. <laughs> you you said <laughs> yeah. please poop Tio, please poop and poop some presents. Right. And since he's covered with a blanket, presents uh, appear under the under the blanket when right. you just uh, uncover it, right. and everybody's very happy. So this is our um, like uh, our tradi traditional Christmas yeah. tradition. And actually, my dad told me he's from the countryside that when he was uh, very young. Uh, the Tio was on fire. Like, it was like a really lock that they just put him on sure. fire. And you just, you, you have to kick him all the time. And there were some candies that appear or so on. And he's like on fire with kids. You were a stick in a lock. Like, this is very <laughs> dangerous for sure. It's time to stop. So this is this is not happening anymore. So for sure. instance, in our in our, our school, we used to do that every day, uh, every year also in my family. So or, there is always my uncle or my dad or my mom. They, they were close to the Tio with the blanket on top of them, suspiciously uh, yeah. placed. Yeah. So they put the presents without nobody noticing. And of yeah. course, it's, I mean, it's so obvious that the children start, oh, I just saw you, how to put the, how do you, did yeah. you put the presents underneath? Yeah. And what is very funny, at least in my family, is at the very end, when there were no more gifts to be pooped, uh, he started poop like, I don't know, an onion or some <laughs> kind of food. Like, okay, this is like the final thing. Yeah, so there is sure. nothing else. So you're in Toronto here for a week um, to kind of put your brains together with other peers in, in, in the field in hopes of trying to come up with some, some new groundbreaking stuff. Mm. Um, 
I, I know we're almost a couple of years out of lockdowns and such, but uh, how does it feel to be like back in person and like talking with people face to face and that sort of thing? Oh, that, that's great. So mm -hmm. for sure. I'm so I kind of adapted during COVID times to, to have all these online meetings. But eventually, since I was staying in Toronto completely alone, uh, it was hard uh, mm. to not interact with people in person for many reasons, not only scientifically speaking, of course, personally speaking, it was not the same. Mm. So everything started to be much, much better when we started to, when we created a bubble and started talking together again. So I really realized how important it is for, for science to talk in front of someone else with a blackboard in front of you and so on. So that changed mm. completely so many things. So, so to me, that, uh, that, that, that was great. And I appreciate that much more after, after COVID, for sure. So it's really important, this kind of in-person in interactions. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what have you been working on here? And should we keep our eyes peeled from, for anything from you soon? Well, uh, I've been working on, uh, on trying to find ways to encode quantum data into a quantum circuit to try to, to apply some quantum machine learning uh, applications uh, to extract uh, some information about this quantum data, like if there is a quantum phase transition or if there is any other interesting change in the, in the quantum state and so on. And that's the thing that we are now trying to understand much better. And that well, it's also helped to discuss with other people here about mm. how we, do we program this properly? Because of course, if we only make some simulations with a few qubits, that's for sure not enough. So you need proper software to develop this much further. And at the same time, I'm also interested to see and, uh, what kind of applications can we run that are hybrid both quantum and, and HPC? Because that's the infrastructure that we will have in our center. So it's, it's very nice to, to interact with other people to see what kind of ideas can we have in that direction. So I hope that we can we can say more things uh, soon. Cool, cool. Um, is there anything coming from the Quantum Spain project in in the future that we can that we can get a little sneak peek on? Or oh, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> first of all, the use the public use of the quantum computer. So that mm. will be one of the first quantum computers to be used in Europe, mm. uh, like uh, publicly available. Let's say for free. Uh, so I expect many people interested in using it, and we will be very happy to, to assist anyone interested on that. Yeah. And on top of that, uh, there are 27 institutions working together to develop a lot of applications and algorithms, especially focused on quantum machine learning. Mm -hmm. And it's great because the, the teams, of course, are extremely interdisciplinary. So 27 groups, it's, it's a lot of people. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely keep an eye on all the research that we are developing. Cool, cool. I'll put some links in the description, too, okay. for... That or like really where to find out more yeah. about it and uh, yeah, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So like we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but like any last words for, for people looking to get into quantum open source or just quantum mm -hmm. machine learning, quantum computing in general? Yeah, I would say what I, what I said at the beginning that um, if you want to enter to this field, maybe it will take you some time depending on your background. But it's just a matter of time and especially motivation, because in the end now, fortunately, we have so many good resources to learn. It's not like you can only access one book and if you don't understand the things, you are lost. Mm. It's like there are so many resources also thanks to open software tools like, like Penny Lane, of course, and, and textbooks that uh, anyone, I think, that now can access to, to this uh, research path. So it's just patience and especially motivation and curiosity. That's the thing. Cool. Mm. Right. OK, I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, mm. Yeah, Alba, thanks so much for, for joining me. Enjoy the rest of your stay in Toronto and safe trip back to Barcelona. And uh, Thank yeah, you. Mm. thanks so much. Cheers.